So we come to our last uh, presenter. This is uh, Pilar Fernandez, uh, Humans and Ticks in Urban Areas. Well, I'm going to try to be interesting for the last talk. Um, I'm Pilar Fernandez. I'm a third year postdoc. Um, and I guess it's going to be my last uh, as an Earth Institute postdoc. But I joined um, this program in 2017, and this is about the same time this project started. Um, and basically, we're studying um, tick-borne diseases, particularly Lyme disease, um, in urban areas, and we're focusing our efforts on Staten Island. This um, project is part of um, the research that we're doing at the Ecoepidemiology Lab, led by Maria Diogwasser, and another person that is very involved in this project is Merit van Acker, who's a PhD student. But we also have um, a long list of collaborators um, that range from epidemiologists to economists to modelers. Um, and then we have our partners at the New York City uh, Department of Health. So in this presentation, um, I'm going to first um, touch base on what's the problem that we're addressing. Then I'm going to um, talk about what the, the approach that we're taking and some results of the modeling aspects of human behavior. So um, I'm an ecologist, but I'm working on health issues, uh, particularly on vector-borne diseases. And I'm interested in understanding the systems as not only as ecological systems, but also how humans are part of it and how they influence it, so as socio-ecological complex systems. So the problem with tick-borne diseases, particularly in the US, is that they account for like the majority of all the vector-borne diseases that have been reporting uh, here. And also, not only the cases have been increasing, um, oh, here's the, but also the geographic range has been expanding. And this is um, distribution 2000. This is what we observed in 2017. But also, and this is part of like what we're addressing here, within long endemic areas as the Northeast, is also expanding into some urban areas. Uh, and the reason for this is because there have been a lot of efforts on the, improving the greening of the cities because green spaces have been associated with uh, human well-being, but at the same time, there are some issues and disservices associated with that, which is the increasing of pests, uh, and in particularly of uh, we're addressing here of tick ticks. Um, and so you can see here, this is a graph of New, um, this is Staten Island, or no, this is New York City in general, where the cases have been increasing, and we observe this trend on Staten Island in particular. And the cases of locally acquired um, Lyme disease have been increasing, particularly on Staten Island. So in 2017, uh, Merith went to different parks in the five boroughs and sampled for ticks in the parks. And she found, and this is her results, um, and she found that most of the ticks were here on Staten Island, which is not a surprise because it's uh, very green. I don't know if you've been to Staten Island. Um, and there's high connectivity between the parks. And also they have um, a deer problem. They have had a, um, the deer population on Staten Island has been increasing. And that's been associated with um, increasing like, tick densities um, and tick-borne diseases. So the ticks that we can find on Staten Island are actually several species. We can find the black-legged tick, which is the one that transmits Lyme disease. We can also find the lone star tick, which is a tick from the south that it's been invading the northeast. Um, and they transmit different diseases. We have also found, um, and this is kind of like fresh results from last year, um, the lone horn tick, which is a new invasive tick from Asia that has, has been invading the US and rapidly expanding. And it's of economic importance, although it hasn't been associated uh, with any um, 
diseases here in the US, but in Asia has, they can transmit some uh, an hemorrhagic fever. We also, um, in 2018, so after we started, we solved this, it's like, okay, we need to concentrate our efforts on Staten Island. So on 2018, uh, we started the sampling the houses, um, and then we found that in the houses, a third of the houses had at least one tick. Um, we selected the houses that were surrounding the parks because we assumed that those were at higher risk of spillover from the parks. And we found the three species with different um, proportions between the different years. So how are tick hazard or tick densities associated with um, cases? So we know that some environmental factors and the host availability will influence the density of ticks. Uh, and in particular, we're focusing on nymphs because that's the most risky stage for humans. Um, but we don't really know how the density of infected ticks translated to Lyme disease cases. Obviously, if you have higher numbers of ticks, the probability of finding one is gonna be higher. But um, this has been, sorry a lot of um, some of the evaluations of, especially of interventions, have seen a reduction on tick densities, but they have seen no reductions on Lyme disease cases. So, what we're proposing, and it's not a novel idea, but surprisingly has not been explored all that much, um, particularly because of it's very complex. Um, we're proposing like, human behavior and the, and the drivers that uh, affect human exposure to the vector will actually interact with the density of ticks to determine Lyme disease cases. And then human behavior becomes a key um, variable in this system. And also landscape configuration, which is also affected by humans but at different scale, can affect the host mobility um, and habitat use of the different hosts of the ticks, that could be deer or mice for example, and the host community composition. So ticks are generalist and they feed on different vertebrates, but they're not all the same. They don't all have the same competence or the same ability to transmit the disease back to the, the ticks. So host community composition, it's a key factor. And because we're focusing on urban areas, most of the research has been done on natural areas such as parks or in suburban areas, uh, where Lyme is typically like the highest, traditionally has been here in the suburban areas like Lyme, that in Connecticut. But we're focusing here on urban areas where we expect that the processes are gonna be a little bit different from what we expect here. Because we expect, because it's gonna be more patchy and more fragmented, that human mobility between the patches and habitat use is gonna become more important in the system, in urban areas. So the interventions that we may propose based on the research done here may not apply here. So it's worth looking into how is it different. So to formalize a little bit um, the problem, we started to think about in the framework of Couple Nurturing Human System, which is a framework proposed by NSF, and we got recently got funded to continue this research uh, with this framework. So basically, this framework focuses on identifying what are the human drivers, for example, how human exposure is driven by human behavior risk perception and, and other um, social determinants of human behavior how the natural system, in this case, the transmission of Lyme disease in natural areas, um, are affected by the host community composition and tick densities. And then what are the coupling processes that play a role and connects both systems? So to whom explain a little bit with the system and the framework we're explaining, we're proposing that we have, in the natural transmission cycle, we have actually two different cycles, one occurring in the parks, which are the sources of the ticks and where you have all the different animals that play a part in the transmission cycle. And then you have the houses and the yards, which have actually a different landscape and a different um, tick um, 
let's, like, let's say resource availability for the ticks and the uh, different hosts. And they're connected via um, host movement and how they use the different habitats, especially particularly by deer and mice. And, and so this is the sources of the ticks that will affect how humans, um, the actual risk the actual tick hazard, as we call it, or the perceived risk, how many ticks people think they are. And people will respond to that by maybe modifying their activity patterns or using personal protection measures. But they can also um, decide to do some several interventions that will affect back the density of ticks in the system. So they can do some interventions at a household level and some interventions at a local level. For example, uh, deer control, or they can invest more in preventing ticks in their own yard. And whatever the different proportion of people, like the different, the collective behavior, I guess, uh, will determine what the Lyme disease risk at a community level. So that will be an emerging property of the system, that it's based on um, individual human behaviors. And these are some pictures of explaining how deer, maybe they, they go into people's houses from the parks. So in this presentation, as I mentioned, uh, I'm gonna be focusing on showing some examples of how human behavior might impact different ways uh, on the risk and how they interact with the, the different um, tick hazards in the parks or in their own yards. Uh, in previous presentations, I've talked about um, how we collected human behavior um, information through the smartphone application. And this is gonna be maybe for a future presentation, uh, the actual results of the, the spillover from the parks into people's houses. So why are we proposing an agent-based model? As I mentioned, the individual behaviors um, will, you know, they sum up to provide an emerging property which is gonna be um, either the Lyme disease risk or the proportion of people finding ticks, so the human tick encounter rate. So we can divide people, we can cite agents different people with different activity patterns and different mobility patterns um, based on what we observe in the actual population. But we can also uh, model some adaptive behaviors because as we know, people will respond to whatever the risk perception is. So the outcomes of the model will be uh, human tick contact rate and if we, the, we add the proportion of ticks that are infected, we can actually derive the Lyme disease incidence. So this is the preliminary model that I started doing. Um, it's very simple, the landscape is a um, fictional landscape where you have a blue square, which is the park, and then you have the urban matrix, and the red squares are the houses that, the yards that have ticks on them and people are randomly assigned in the space. And I assign for this preliminary model, I assign a random walk where people walk randomly in any direction at each time step. Some of them will go in and interact with like the yards and some with the parks or some will stay within the urban matrix. And I assign a probability of um, encounter a tick if they touch a risky area of 3%. And I let it run for 90 days to simulate the summer, which is the risk season. And I tested different scenarios. So in the first one, I didn't include any adaptive behavior. So every time a person encounter a tick, they would still continue their random walk. Um, but then I compared to this, I compared three other scenarios and tested what was the effect of the different adaptive behaviors would have on the tick encounter rate. So the first one was to avoid the park. So if they found a tick, whatever it was, they thought it, they found it in the park, so they stopped going to the park altogether. And then the second one, and you can see, the, so the blue line is the tick encounters in the park, and the red line are the tick encounters in people's yards. So the yards, 
still they, they, you don't see any change, but you see a decrease in the in the ticks and country in the parks, which is pretty obvious. Um, for the use of personal protective measures, what I, uh, what I simulated is that that proportion of that probability of finding a tick being given that they went into a, a risky area will be reduced by half. So instead of being 3%, will be 1.5. They could still encounter it, but the risk was going to be lower. Um, and then you see that the probability in the parks didn't decrease, probably because it was not all that much to start with, but the main impact was in the parks. And then they spray with, um, with so the, other, the third one was they actually did something actively and they spread the yards with ticks. Uh, sorry, they sprayed the yards against ticks. And so if they found a tick, they thought they got it in their own house, so they actually prompted a, a behavior of mitigation and trying to reduce the ticks in the yard. So when we uh, measure the effects of the different interventions, we also, like, they were all different, significantly different from no having any adaptive behavior, and the highest effect was um, avoiding the park. So now what we need to do with this is to integrate it with the data that we're collecting in, in, on Staten Island. So we're going to people's houses to um, collect ticks in the yard to actually determine that proportion of yards that have ticks uh, and what tick species that they have um, and if they react all the same for the different tick species, regardless of it's the black lug tick or another one. We also do knowledge study to some practice surveys where we collect data to simulate the human behavior. We collect data on their knowledge, their perceived risk, and how are they protecting themselves. Um, and we are including some best worst choice experiments to try to understand a little bit better of their investment choices. Um, and then we are to get some more detail about the human behavior uh, and similar to what Nicolas showed, we're implementing uh, a smartphone application that we have been working on. So this is the smartphone application. Um, we recently published a paper um, about understanding who, like, who was using it, um, kind of doing an assessment of the biases that are in our data set that we've been collecting. The idea is to use this information to model the mobility patterns and the activity patterns. And we're asking people to complete every day if they found a take on themselves, but more importantly for us is what activities they've done and if um, they use any protective measures. And we also track their location. Um, and the third um, thing that I'm working on, and, and this is what I'm working on actually right now, is to better understand using that um, theoretical model still, uh, trying to understand what are the different coupling processes and how the human, the adaptive human behavior actually relates to uh, the tick density to create um, the patterns that we observe. Are we stuck in a vicious cycle where we see a stabilizing loop and it doesn't change um, the, um, tick, the, the Lyme disease cases? And can we break out of that uh, so our interventions actually have an effect? And the ultimate goal is to have a simulation platform where we can try different interventions and then we can make recommendations um, and make uh, cost-effective recommendations for these areas. So, thank you. So, um, oops. so we have time for questions for this speaker. Um, we, we also have time if anybody's thought of a question for any of the other speakers, because I think they're all still here. Uh, but let's start here. Uh, thank you, Pilar, for your presentation. 
uh, in your agent-based model, you have these agents randomly walking in these areas. There is any way to characterize better those agents in the sense that, for instance, children are going with a higher probability to parks or to schools, and probably adults are just going to the downtown, I don't know, like the office areas or things like that? Yeah, so um, in the model right now we have, we're only going to model adults um, just because we have limitations on the data that we can collect and the kids. Uh, we can make assumptions then later based on the data collected from the, the adults what, the, take the, what their children will behave like. Um, but that's, we have some limitations on getting that information. But we know that one of the, the risk groups is actually children. So we need to address that. How, how does the, the tick counting process work? Like, get so, a picture. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, in this mm, preliminary model, it's very simple. Uh, every time they touch into, they say, let you, they go into a patch that it's a park, they have a 3% probability of finding a tick. I meant like whenever you go to that. Oh, uh, in, in the real life? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, Ticks are basically questing, uh, looking for host. So if you are, for example, black-legged ticks like to be in lift litter or in um, places that are humid. So if you go into the parks and you walk off the trails or you go into places where there's lift litter, um, you might have um, ticks questing or looking for a host. So then they basically attach to you. Um, they don't move, so they don't, they're not, they go move up and down questing, but they don't go after you. Um, they're not gonna go hunt you. Um, and the same in the, in the houses. So what we're thinking is that uh, for in a places like Staten Island, which is representative of other urban places, is that most of the ticks are in the parks and they go into people's houses by, they're being transported by deer, for example, which, or other animals that visit the houses of the yards. I'm curious, so if the tick is questing and you come relatively close to the, the tick, what is the probability that that quest is going to be successful and it gets on you? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, we don't know, actually. Um, so there's a, because it, it really depends on a lot of things. Um, so, and, and actually, coming into that 3% uh, probability, it's actually derived from the, the actual prevalence overall in the population. Um, because, so ticks are gonna be questing. Um, so once they attach to you, there's a there's few things that need to happen. First, you need to encounter that tick, which can be really patchy. And it really depends on like micro distribution of the, t of the, the tick population. Uh, but let's say they're everywhere. Um, there's also a probability of um, that tick, once they attach to you, if you haven't done any protective measures against that tick, they'll have to find a place for it to attach. So that may take, it take time. Um, but it's, an after, like for example, let's say you, after you come, you've been outdoors, you take a shower, you might wash it off if it hasn't been attached because they don't attach right away. And also if you use some protective measures, like you adjust your clothing and you put your socks up your like uh, hands and sleeves and then the probability of that tick actually finding a place to attach will be lower. So there's a few things at play in that. Oh, sorry. I am. So this is. I. I didn't want to go into a lot of details because I. I've, I've been presenting this um, in the past, but let me show you a picture. Um, so when we collect the ticks, let me show you here. So when we collect the ticks, uh, we do it by dragging. Um, basically, it's a corduroy cloth, the one by one meter, um, and we try to get the ticks that are questing. So we're trying to simulate uh, a host brushing against um, that area. So we're gonna get not all the ticks that are out there, but the ones that are questing. Um, not all ticks are questing at the same time. 
So you're only going to get a proportion. So it's like um, a relative abundance, uh, and it's not absolute numbers. We've uh, come to the end of our time. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers for putting together terrific talks. Um, I hope to see you again uh, in the spring semester for a different group of people. I'd like to thank um, uh, uh, Samantha, who uh, is the brains and the effort behind all of this. And um, if anybody is a PhD student and is interested in uh, the postdoc program. Uh, I'm the person to talk to about that. Um, I'm, I'd love to do that. Um, we're, as I said in the beginning of our selection process for the next group of people, but uh, hopefully this program will continue for many years to come. Uh, thank you all again for coming and the speakers for speaking. See you soon.